Hello. Uh, oh, I've lost my first slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tom Cadwallander, and uh, I'm going to give a, a wee presentation about winter birds in the northeast coast, particularly about Northumberland. The, the title, which uh, the title slide I've just lost. Uh, Do you it's put this on the telly. Pardon. Sorry. Uh, the the, um, uh, the title slide I've just lost, but it's the where geese. Uh, to whistlers via whops, and that that title refers to some of the species that we're going to be looking at. Local uh, colloquial names uh, for some of those species. So, uh, but primarily, it's a talk about uh, winter birds, coastal winter birds, and they are fantastic. You know, these birds are coming from an awful long way north to visit us, and when you see some of the, kind of the what? I mean, I'm hearing some echo stuff. Right? Oh, I'm trying to sort that out, Tom. Just someone's unmuted themselves a few times. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. Just trying to work out who it is, but they keep coming in and out. Right. Should we Should we start again? Do you think that? By, <laughs> ah, I found you, Sue. If it's okay, I'm just going to mute you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, right. I'll. I'm just going to start the recording again, Tom. If that's okay. Let's go back to the beginning then. Oh. How do we get out? Oh. That's it, yeah, back to the big, I get I've got my title slide, that's, I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm content. As you wish, James. You're good to go. <laughs> Hello, uh, this is Tom Cadwallander, and uh, uh, today my talk's gonna be uh, about winter birds on the Northumberland coast. Uh, it's from were geese to whops via whistlers. And those kind of names are referred to um, colloquial names for, for some bird species that we're going to have a look at during the course of this presentation. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a, a kind of a long term bird watcher and I work as a freelance uh, ornithologist, bird surveyor. I also work as a, as a tour guide and, and lecturer and broadcaster. So I've been bird watching on the North Island coast. So uh, quite a number of years and uh, I'm, to be to be honest I'm probably into my um, sixth decade of, of bird watching on the Northumberland coast. A lot of times it's about casual stuff just my kind of normal observations as I'm out wandering around and other times it's it's about sort of uh, scientific endeavour. Um, you may know that I'm BTO British Trust for Ornithology regional rep for Northumberland and I have been for the last um, 30, 30 plus years. So um, when it comes to recording uh, and talking about birds, I like to think there is a scientific basis to what I'm saying. Some will be anecdotal, but, but most of it will be, will be science-based, and it's about data. You, you'll know the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology, is a, it's a, a fantastic organisation, but we collect data, and that, that informs our, our, kind of our knowledge about uh, bird populations and behaviour and so forth. So that's where I'm coming from. So... Uh, now I just want to sort of get into really some of these fabulous birds that are going to come to our bit of coastline. Um, and it's not just the Northumberland coast, it is the, it's the northeast coast as well, but particularly the Northumberland coast, that's where my experience lies mainly. But when you think about the winter and you think actually it's generally speaking the Northumberland or the east coast uh, winter environment is quite benign, believe it or not, even with 
kind of when you see snowy scenes. Snowy scenes at the, on the shore is are, are quite unusual, and uh, but they do occur. And you, when you see these scenes and you see the, how how rough and and ready this the, the sea can be, you think actually, why do birds want to come here for the winter? But then you have to just cast your mind, just squint your eyes up a little bit and think about where these birds are coming from. They're coming from an awful long way north. And I'll be saying that quite a bit during the course of this next hour or so. Um, these birds are coming from an awful long way north. And can you imagine how, how bad it is, how bad the weather is, where they're coming from, if they want to come and spend time here and all the kind of the, 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 um, the, the, the kind of the, um, the trials and tribulations that are involved in getting here. But actually the journeys are, are, are amazing. And some of their stories are amazing, and hopefully we'll explore some of those. And when we when we sort of work through the through the course of the presentation, but yeah, why why the Northumberland coast? Why the northeast coast? But yeah, it doesn't take long to figure out why. The these are examples of designations we have on our bit of coastline, um, and these designations have been created because birds have been coming here. There are special protection areas, special areas of conservation, Ramsar sites. These three are international, internationally important areas. So it's an international recognition of how important our bit of coastline is. The special protection area and, and uh, special area of conservation are created through the uh, Natura 2000 suite, which is European, uh, European uh, Union designation. The Ramsar site is a, is a, a worldwide designation. And the rest of them are national, the SSSIs, the National Nature Reserves, local wildlife sites, they're all a recognition of how important and how good our, um, uh, our coastline is for, uh, for, for, for birds. But we're talking primarily about uh, two groups of birds. There's wildfowl and waders, and uh, we'll, we'll work our way through the wildfowl bits first. When you Travel into Lindisfarne National Nature Reserve, and if you haven't been, you should go. Now is a fabulous time to go because birds are, are arriving uh, and the, the numbers are, are building. This is a view across um, the uh, Fenham Flats with the tides up, and you can get a glimpse of, of, of what is actually going on here. The sky is full of widgeon and brent geese, but we'll start to tease out their stories in just a, a wee while, but just to gives you a clue to the importance of this of this area and how kind of vibrant the whole place is. Brent geese, bra the, the geese split into two different groups. There's greys and blacks. So we'll talk about the black geese first. Now, now Brent geese are quite small geese and they're coming down from Svalbard and they pile into, um, into Lindisfarne National Nature Reserve and they're pill bellied or light bellied Brent geese. And these birds are coming from a very, very particular place. They're coming from Svalbard which is Spitsbergen, and uh, the, we share this population with a, a little site in Denmark, and these birds are coming to us, and they're now in. There is about um, six to 7,000 of these birds, but they're actually, they're beautiful. The black geese are, tend, to be, tend to be smaller than the grey geese, um, and the, the black geese indicate the kind of the, 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 the neck and the head black, but look at that little white fleck on its neck there. That tells you it's a brent goose and the pale bellied variety uh, have got pale bellies compared to the darks and the, the brent geese fall into two um, subspecies. Uh, there are dark bellies and light bellies and what we get here primarily and historically have been the, the, the pale bellies or light bellies uh, and they're, they're, they're really quite a, an attractive uh, goose really and you can see from this diagram how or where they're coming from. Uh, coming from Svalbard, and you can see, uh, we'll just use the point, the point of the cursor here. See, there's this little point in Denmark here, where there is a, a good number of them, and across here at Lindisfarne, we share, and there's a little point down here, but not very many of them go there. So there's a, we share the entire world's population of Svalbard pale belly Brent geese with, uh, with, with Denmark. And if the weather, if the wind, if the weather, um, sorry, the winter is... Uh, it's all bad in Denmark, which it has a habit to be. Um, we can have the entire world population of Svalbard Brent geese, wintering population of Svalbard Brent geese, a Lindisfarne National Nature Reserve. Quite incredible, really, when you think about it. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's the, one of the, uh, the, the jewels of the crown. It's a blue star species. 
But you can see the journeys they make and the, the, the fly south from Svalbard uh, hits the, hit the Norwegian coast, drop down and um, we share the population with, uh, with Denmark, as you can see from this diagram. And this bird was, uh, that we show here, it's not a particularly good photograph, and, uh, but it was taken at a quite a long distance. And the idea of the photograph is to show off the colorings because this bird was ringed at Lindisfarne in 1996. So it's made at least 25 journeys, sorry, 25 years old. So it's made um, the journey uh, 48 times. So 3000 kilometers at, at 48 times. It just shows the kind of the, 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 the journeys these birds have and how particularly important these winter quarters are uh, for these birds. So it's amazing when you think of that, that, that story. But pale bellies are, are, are quite small geese, as I've mentioned, and they're hardly much bigger than, than, uh, than mallards, you know, uh, but they, they're quite feisty and they, they, they really enjoy living life on the edge. Um, and uh, they will travel in, in family groups and they'll gather in quite big numbers at, at Lindisfarne, six to 7,000 can be seen um, uh, at any one time really. But we do get dog bellies, which is a, quite a recent phenomenon, believe it or not. And you can see, if you compare this one now to the, to the pale bellies, we can see how this has got a, a slightly darker, you might have to squint your eyes up a little bit to see, to, to imagine the, 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 the differences here, but it's a, a different, from a different population. But again, it still has this white fleck on its neck, which tells you it's a Brent goose and it's the coloration of the belly. Sometimes it's hard to tell. But whilst we have the, the Brent, the pale bellies or the light bellies on the mud flats, and they will feed on, um, on Zostra, which is kind of a seaweed, uh, a floating grass. When the tide's in, this grass will, will float um, and become uh, sort of, uh, which will grow. But once the tide's out, it becomes available to these geese to feed. And an old Northumbrian name for, for seaweed is, is where, and the, um, the old Northumbrians would see the Brent geese feeding on the seaweed, the, the were, and they would call them uh, were geese. So hence the, the, the name, the, the, the were geese. So, but when we see the dark bellies coming to Lindisfarne, which is quite a recent phenomenon, they're feeding more or less on farmland, which is quite an interesting contrast. Um, I've been doing quite a lot of survey work at, at Lindisfarne on the mudflats, looking at um, uh, geese distribution. And it's quite interesting, we'll see at low tide, we can see um, both uh, light bellies and dark bellies on the mudflats. But there is a, quite a clear demarcation that generally don't mix too well on the mudflats. But as soon as, the, as soon as it becomes sort of uh, feeding time, the dark bellies will lift and fly to the nearby farmland, whereas the the, the light bellies uh, will actually stay on the mudflats, although they will travel on the farmland as well. But it's quite an interesting sort of um, kind of contrast that I, I find it quite interesting. But the dark bellies are coming from a slightly different place. And um, this is quite an interesting diagram. You can see the, the, the green line in the center. These are the, the Svalbard birds. You can see how they're spending time in Lindisfarne and Denmark. So there's, they're the ones that we're used to. And there's a population of of pale bellies, which is coming down from Greenland and northern, northern Canada. And they're, they're coming down and spending time on the west coast. But we also see some of these dark bellies breeding in Siberia. And they're coming right down through here. And this is the blue line. And you can see how they're coming and wintering in, in southern Britain. And, um, and there's just now starting to, to edge up into, into Northumberland, in the, into the northeast. And there's probably about two or three hundred of these birds at Lindisfarne now. Uh, and, 10 years ago, that never happened. So we're actually seeing a change in that, a significant change in that behavior. It could be as a result of climate change. It probably is as a result of climate change, but we are watching that change with great interest. And um, it, it's happening with a number of different species as well. So we're, we're seeing quite a change going on here. But Brent goose, Brent geese are the kind of the, the jewel in the crown of, uh, of the Northumberland coast when it comes to wildfowl. But along with those, we have barnacle geese. And we've just seen barnacle geese the last week and a half. Barnacles have been coming south, pouring south, um, from coming from the same place as the Brents, believe it or not, from Svalbard. And they come through in September. They, they will hit the east coast of, uh, of Britain and they will follow the coast down and they'll cross of the, through the, 
the, the, um, the fourth gap or the time gap to cross the Solway because they'll tend to winter uh, on the Solway and on Islay. Uh, these are fabulous looking geese. And, but recently, again, another change in behaviour, but there's about six to 700 of these birds will now winter at Lindisfarne. They're not making the final leg of the journey crossing the UK, um, crossing mainland to get to the West Coast, the staying on the East Coast, which is a, a real big contrast to, to what they did. Again, it must have been only about 10 to 15 years ago where you would just, you would see them traveling through on migration, uh, but you would never see them sort of overwintering. But they went overwintering in, in, uh, in significant numbers now, several hundreds of them will overwinter. And again, it's at Lindisfarne, usually to be found um, just north of, of Butel Bay in that, that female, uh, fielding uh, sort of arrangement there in the kind of Rossback Sand sort of area. But again, they're, they're a quite an attractive goose, uh, black neck, but instead of having the uh, black face of a Brent uh, and the white fleck on the neck of a Brent, they've got a, a white face. Barnacles have got a white face. Again, they're not particularly big geese, but they stand a little bit taller than the, um, uh, than the Brent. And they're probably about the same sort of size as a, as a shelter, but they're quite, quite attractive. But you can see in this diagram where these birds are coming from. And we have several different populations. And that's the fascinating thing about birds leaving the Northern climes. We see different races of them coming from the kind of the, um, the high Arctic and wintering in different places. And that's, it's quite important that we recognize different races are coming from different places because that, that helps us in terms of our uh, conservation goals to, to protect the, the breeding areas and protecting the wintering areas of, of these different populations. And it's, it's the, the population of, uh, of, of individual kind of groups is quite important that we, well, that we know that. But let, look, let's look at this, uh, the, the barnacles that we get. And we can see Svalbard, Svalbard up here, and these birds are hitting the Norwegian uh, coast, and they're following the coast down, and they will they will cross uh, when they hit the east coast of, of of Scotland and down into northern England. They will use various flyways, traditional flyways. They're using um, uh, topography to help them navigate. Uh, a couple of three weeks ago, I was in Speyside. I was in um, uh, Strathdern in, in the uh, one of the deep valleys there. And I picked up a group of uh, about uh, 20, 25 barnacles flying along the Strathdern Valley heading southwest. So if you can see this line here, this is probably what they were doing. So Strathdern is in here. So they're picking this line up. So they were going to drop straight down into the Solway here. Whereas the birds generally what we see coming down on the east coast, they'll hit the uh, east coast of Scotland. Some will cross at the fourth and some will fly down the east coast and actually find the Tyne Gap and cross through the Tyne onto the west coast. It's quite a traditional thing that these birds do. And it's, it's quite interesting. As I said, we've, in the last 10 days, we've seen a huge number of barnacles head south um, coming through here. There, there appeared to be a, a bit of a hiatus. They were, they were, they were late for, for whatever reason. Um, every year is different anyway, of course. Um, but sort of by a few days, and this, this year happened to be a little bit of a, a later year than normal. Uh, but once they once they hit, they, they started making their way quite quickly. But you do see birds heading, or we did see birds heading back north again. And you think, what's that about? These birds are supposed to be heading, supposed to be heading south, looking for various points. And what they were doing, they got themselves disorientated, and they'd be looking for various um, ge geographical um, points, whether it was the whether it was Cheviot, so they can actually sort of locate from there and head on there, continue on their migration, or whether we're looking for the, the, their traditional valley, whether it was the Fourth Valley or whether it was the Tyne Valley, reorientating and then heading down. Because if they've traveled south on a, on a northerly wind, they could have easily overshot a little bit of uh, their, their little kind of exit route, if you like, across the mainland Britain. Fascinating. And visible migration is just one of the the most wonderful things that we can experience as humans. These birds are, are traveling thousands of miles and they're, regardless of what's going on, they're gonna make their journey. But we are seeing uh, a slight change in that, driven by, by climate change. And it's a phenomenon known as short stopping. Short stopping is, a, is, a, is a, a very recent thing and it's where birds which are travel long distances will, will stage in various places. And they're going to stage there until 
the weather in that point kind of uh, kicks them out because the weather can change. Migration is an incredibly expensive uh, occupation and they will, uh, it could cost them their lives, the ultimate cost. So birds will, will actually, um, will not make the journey if they don't have to. And some birds are, and we'll look at other species um, uh, as well through, through the course of the talk, other species are doing that as well. They're staying over and making the journey. It could be the point where with, um, uh, with the, the barnacles that have stayed a little bit further north because of the weather's been fairly kind to them. So they stayed to feed, to make the journey easier for later on. But anyway, they've made it. But it's fascinating. Migration is one of the most wonderful things, as I've said. Sorry if I keep repeating myself, but it, it, um, even at my great age, in my experience, I'm still in awe of, of bird migration. It is just something we don't know enough about it at all. We don't know enough. So moving on to grey geese. We've talked about black geese, so we're moving on to grey geese. Um, so there's, there's two or three or three species of, of grey geese we're going to cover now. Um, and as the name suggests, they're um, a grey as opposed to being black. So the most common one we have is the grey like goose. And it's quite ubiquitous because there, there is a feral population of uh, grey lags around. And um, it kind of confuses the, the story. But grey lags are identified by their big orange bills. They, they're unmistakable. We'll look at a couple of the other uh, grey geese that we see regularly and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the differences there when we get to them. But big orange bills on grey geese are grey lags. As I've said, the, the, um, there is a, uh, a, a large feral population and they breed quite readily uh, in, the, in around this, this part of the world. And they have this kind of molt migration as well, so they move around a little bit. But we tend to forget, because of the feral population, that they are migratory. And a lot of the geese that we have, a lot of the grey lags, are coming down from Iceland. And a couple of winters ago, I picked up this bird on the Alnestri. I live on the Alnestri, I've got close by to it. And this was in the, one of the fields with, with I, I took to be uh, largely feral grey lags. There was, a, there was about 50 or 60 of them. But I picked out this neck collar. It doesn't look very good, admittedly. Uh, the bird was under no discomfort with this, this neck collar, but it was actually quite informative. I got the, 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 um, the ring number quite easily and I tracked back on it. I thought it was going to be part of the English population that, uh, uh, that breeds in the Lake District and, and uh, has a molt migration into Lancashire, uh, further into Lancashire, to, um, to, to molt. But actually it wasn't. This bird was actually ringed in Iceland two years before I saw it. It sort of reminded me that these birds are coming from Iceland. A lot of the birds are coming from Iceland and they're mixing with our, with our feral birds, which is fascinating in its own way. So it's worth remembering that uh, the grey lag goose is, is, does occur in, in, in the wild, in our part of the world, believe it or not. So yes, this is probably the biggest of the uh, of the grey geese that we have, and I mentioned the grey, uh, the big orange conchid got as well. But probably one of the most evocative of the grey geese is the pink foot or the pink feet, as we kind of easily refer to them. And these birds have been moving south for the last two or three weeks, and when you hear your first one of the autumn, they are uh, oh, it, I, I just get a tingle when you hear them. And it, this, it's often described as a, uh, a wink, 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 wink sort of noise as they as they call, and they call quite readily when they when they're flying. And we see them in large V's, and they are coming across quite high. Historically, we didn't really have that many uh, pink feet overwintering in Northumberland, but actually, because these birds were were heading further south, these birds were heading south into south. North Norfolk and perhaps even in the, into the southwest, uh, Martin Near and that sort of area. But actually, in the last few years, we've had, we've had a, a decent number, tens, 10, 15,000 of these birds are now staying within the region. And Druidge Bay, Lindisfarne, and the Millfield Plain are now sort of, sort of key places for these birds to, um, to overwinter. But they're, 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 they come through in quite big numbers and they will, uh, they will move around quite readily and they will fly at night, but they will, you will hear them at night as well. With their wink make noise, but they're quite identified. So remember the uh, the grey lag, the grey lag has, has the big orange bill, whereas the the pink foot has quite a small dainty bill, quite a dark bill, but it has this this pink band to it. 
It also has the pink legs, but superficially very similar to grey lats. But the, um, these birds are coming from an awful long way north, like the, um, uh, like the grey lags, they're coming from Iceland, but also they're coming from uh, a long way north in Greenland. Initially, we, until kind of technology was helping us, we thought they were just coming from Iceland. You can just, you can just see Iceland just underneath this little, these traces here. But we've got traces now coming from northern, northern Greenland which is quite phenomenal when you think about it. These birds are coming, coming back uh, in quite big numbers. And 20 years ago, we had really big concerns about the population of pink feet. They, the numbers were, were going down. They were, they were harvested, should we say, in the most charitable of ways uh, by, the, by, by the Icelanders. They would, they would shoot them basically and to eat. And um, those big concerns about the numbers were not really recovering and they couldn't, uh, the numbers went, couldn't really sustain the, the harvest that they were going under um, by, by, the, uh, by the Icelanders. But in the last 20 years, there's been a, a kind of reduction in, in the hunting, and that's meant that these birds can recover, the population has recovered, and we're now seeing them coming uh, and, and expanding their, their range, which is quite fantastic when you think about uh, a lot of the, 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 the stories of, of other species sort of re re restricting their range. But these ones are expanding the range, but they're coming down in big numbers. So when we see pinks, as we refer to them, or pink feet or pink footed goose coming through, think about how far these birds have come. Absolutely magical. But because we, we, we've got these large gatherings of geese now, we've, uh, we're starting to attract the slightly rarer ones. These are our white fronted. There's two distinct populations of, of white fronted geese. Um, there's a group which comes from the east, the European ones, and there's a group which comes from the west or the northwest, which are the Greenland ones. So these birds are coming and wintering with us, with us in quite small numbers, and they're attracted to us by the, the numbers of geese that we have wintering here, and in fields they'll, they'll call and they're brought down and they'll come and gather around them. But we see these white fronts, the, the, um, uh, they're coming down from, from Arctic Siberia, to winter in southern Britain, but actually now we're, we're finding more of them are, are spending their winter in a little bit further north. Another species which kind of just slightly changing its range, uh, just expanding its winter range just a little bit, fascinating in its, in its way. And um, so yes, the, the, uh, it's making the difference, but actually along the lines of the, uh, of the geese and the, and the wildfowl or waterfowl, we're seeing birds using different habitats, wet, uh, wet farmland, wet grassland, as well as salt marsh, as well as uh, mudflats, are all playing their part in providing a winter home for lots of, um, uh, lots of geese and lots of, lots of duck species. The numbers of widgeon are building now. This is a group of widgeon which is in eclipse plumage. And the eclipse plumage, if you're not aware of it, is this kind of intermediate plumage between their breeding plumage in the summer and their breeding plumage which will they'll attain at the back of the winter uh, before they head off back north again. So there, there is a period where these birds will be flightless but that's before they reach here uh, and they become very vulnerable. They have this wildfowl have this kind of crazy um, mold strategy where they'll drop all their flight feathers at the same time and become flightless. So they adopt this eclipse plumage so they become much more cryptic so they, they can become camouflaged. Uh, and um, so yes, th this is why they're like almost quite difficult to, to identify because they become fairly nondescript. Although with widgeon, you can see the males would still have the, this kind of uh, pale buffish crown on the, on the forehead. And these birds, their call is their, is their You'll hear it across the salt marsh. Teal, the next species, will do, be doing the same. So these are the whistlers in, our, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the title. But we're seeing these birds now, and they're just starting to gather. There's several hundred here on the owl nestry, but actually at Lindisfarne, we're talking about the peak. It can be something like 20 to 30,000 birds at Lindisfarne, which is a phenomenal number. And they will spend the first half of the winter at Lindisfarne. And as they um, move on, as the winter progresses, these birds will then leave and head southwest into uh, an area we think uh, uh, closely by the, 
the um, the day estuary. So they'll, they'll go down there for the kind of the a chunk of the second part of the winter. Then when the the, the, the urges to return uh, kick in, they will head back north and spend the last few weeks of their uh, winter at Lindisfarne before they head north again. Amazing, actually. So they, they, they really are quite a, 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 a fabulous looking um, duck species. The male is, is kind of very identifiable with this, this um, uh, buffish coloured forehead. But check out the, the white and the wings. When you see these birds fly, even the females have quite a lot of white in the wings, but the males have a lot of white in the wings. And they'll fly in quite a tight formation. But if you check out the wing shape, the wing shape is that they've got swept back wings and they're almost like scimitar shaped. They're quite identifiable in flight, these birds. So it's quite helpful. But in the, on the water, on the grass, they're very easy to, 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 to sort. And we can see where these birds are coming from. These birds are coming from, again, from parts of central, northern central Europe and indeed um, uh, uh, northern, northern Russia. So they're coming from quite a way north. And it's going to be a recurring theme within this presentation that the, the birds that we're talking about are coming from an awful long way north uh, to winter here. So you can imagine what it's like in their breeding grounds. So the window of breeding is really quite short in effect. Um, but yeah, so they, they, they do come to the benign shores of the British Isles. But the most common, I think, uh, and the smallest of the, the, the wintering wildfowl that we have uh, with us during the uh, any given year is the, the teal. Um, this is the female, fairly nondescript, but the male is quite, quite splendid. Uh, and you can see, just look at the wing and the speculum here. You can see why the, the colour was named teal. Uh, it just emulates this so well. But the, the vermiculations on the side of that breast and the, the colour of the, of, the, of the head. But actually, if, you, if you're thinking about ident identification, one of the, the one of the best identification tips for me um, for uh, for teal is this little yellow triangle at the back end of the uh, of the bird, and you can see that actually if that, if its head stuck into the reeds, sometimes the tail the bum is only, is sticking out there, and you can pick that out, and you know exactly you know exactly what it is. It's a teal, uh, because you don't always get the, the the head splendor and all of that sort of business. But if you see that uh, that little yellow triangle you've got it as a teal so these birds are, are coming this is in pristine breeding plumage so this will be in february time they don't come to us in this sort of plumage this plumage is kind of changing now they're going to they're going through their molt from their eclipse plumage to their their breeding plumage so they'll attain their breeding plumage the at the back of the of our year into january into february so they're looking at their best before they set off on their on their return migration and they're looking at their breasts at their best fabulous but the teals are coming from from right across central europe and uh, it's quite incredible this is this is a, a list of a uh, ring recoveries um coordinated through the the, the bto uh, and the, the ringer scheme but it gives a clue to how widespread um the teal is uh, as, a, as a breeding species and they do breed in the in the british islands as well of course Alongside the, the wildfowl, to kind of complete the, the kind of a wildfowl picture, we've got swans. And um, they, as, as you know, we have three species of swans in the British Isles, uh, coming to the British Isles or, or living in the British Isles. The mute swan, which is the, um, the resident one and it was introduced by the Romans. Um, and that's the one with the, um, uh, the, the knob on its head. It's a resident species, doesn't migrate. But we have two migrating species, the Buick swan, uh, which comes down from uh, from northern Russia. It winters in very very small numbers in, in northern England, more in the south in sort of the in the southwest. Interestingly, named after Thomas Buick, the uh, 18th century engraver, who was uh, a Northumbrian. Which is so we have got a little bit of a connection to the um, to the species of Buick swan, although we don't see them very often in this part of the world. But we do see Hooper swans uh, or Whooper swans in decent numbers and they will come through in there uh, and, and, and they're coming through now and you'll pick them up and they have just a, a wonderfully evocative noise that they make when they're when they're traveling but again I'll just point out well we've got the chance here you notice the the orange at the side of the bill uh, it's all black bill but notice the the orange yet sort of orange it's more of a yellow um, 
Whereas it's a triangle on the Hooper swan. But if you see a Buick swan, it's a really, it's this corner, this triangle is cut off and it's, uh, it's very foreshortened. So it's, it's they're quite easy to, to sort out if you get a decent look at their bill. And uh, Buick swans tend to be um, thinner necked and slightly smaller, but that's sometimes hard to, to pick out. But look at the bill colors. Um, the, this is, these are classic Hooper swans, that yellow triangle on the bill. Um, but these birds are, are coming in and uh, Linda swans a good place to see them. We'll see them feeding in fields, but they also come onto the shore to, uh, to have a wash and brush up. Uh, and they're, they're really quite spectacular when you, when you see them. But these birds are coming down from Iceland. We know that because we've got some quite detailed um, uh, tracings on them. The, the, in the old days, we used to rely solely on, on ring numbers um, and bodies being found or birds being recaptured. But in terms of big birds like that, you tend not to recapture them. You, you, you're, you're relying on, on finding dead ones. Um, but actually now with technology, there, is, there are radio transmitters, there are satellite transmitters, all manner of, of um, uh, techno stuff on them. So we actually trace them quite, quite nicely. But these, these birds will travel down from Iceland and it has been noted that they, they'll travel with something like 30,000 feet as they're, as they're crossing this section of, uh, of the North Atlantic. And uh, I, I don't know whether it was apocryphal or what, but certainly I've heard tales of um, jumbo jet pilots back in the day, crumbling from the US, actually seeing Cooper swans not too far away from them, flying at a similar sort of altitude, which is, which is quite a, a, an amazing thing. But you know, the, the, all these birds that breed in the high Arctic, they're, they're, I've, I've mentioned before, they're, they're breeding grounds. There is only a small window of opportunity when the winter recedes and allows them those few weeks to get in there. And if they time their return migration uh, incorrectly, they get back too soon and the breeding grounds are still frozen. You think, well, what's the point? Actually, Hooper swans will actually return back to, um, to the UK, um, the northern UK, to continue their winter, then they'll, they'll, they'll try again as, as a subsequent point. And so they, they do kind of adjust a little bit uh, during the, the course of their migration. But it's fascinating to think that birds can actually do that. But it's a question of timing. It is, it's crucial that, that um, I suppose everything is a compromise, but it's crucial that birds get back early. The, the, the early birds get the best sites, gets the best, get the best breeding sites. And, and that's what they're all vying for. So they, they, they tend to try and get back as, as early as they can. But moving on from wildfowl, we're kind of thinking of um, uh, the, 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 the shorebirds, the kind of the, uh, the wading birds. And in our part of the world, we haven't got a huge number of estuaries, but we've got a few kind of decent ones. And, but it's the mudflats that make, make the difference. It's a soft shore. And waders, and as, as you'll know, waders have got a, uh, a multitude of uh, adaptation from very long billed birds to very short billed birds. And um, th it's all about where they can feed. And this sort of environment, these, these muddy shores, this, this is full of, full of kind of food. Um, I have been told that uh, for a cubic meter of estuarine mud has more um, biomass than an Amazon rainforest. An Amazon rainforest will have more biodiversity, but there are more animals in a cubic meter of mud than there is in a, in a cubic meter of kind of rainforest. It's a hard one to get your head around that one, but there are more animals living in there. And they're all living at various steps. And all these worm casts, there's, there's ragworms and the lugworms and there's all other, other creatures living in there. And they're all food, if you like, for, for our wading birds. And there's a, a, a fantastic level of adaptation going on. And of course, the biggest um, of the, uh, the wading birds that we have, and, and a species which is under a huge amount of pressure as a breeding species, and that's the curlew. It's the wop, as the, the old uh, northern name for it. It's, it's the Scottish name for it as well. Um, hence, the, this is the kind of the, the, the other item in the, uh, the, the title. But these birds do winter uh, in the UK, and uh, the breeding birds tend to leave, and we, they're backfilled, they, those areas are backfilled by, by birds from Finland. But you can see this bird's bill, long decurved bill, um, um, quite distinctive in flight, but it's the largest of the, the wading birds that we have. You can see here more clearly here, the, uh, uh, the, the long decurved bill, adapt, ad adapted to feed on uh, invertebrates living in mud. And uh, 
There is a sexual dimorphism going on with curlews. It's quite interesting. It's, it's not always easy to, to discern because the, uh, it's down a bill length. Females tend to have a longer bill than the males. This is, for me, a female uh, because you never see a male uh, with a bill this then. Some, sometimes you can't tell, but when it's a long bill, you can tell. This is it for me as a female. And the females will tend to, actually the older females will tend to hold territory in the winter quarters, whereas some of the younger females and the males will not hold territory so much. But they can be found right across mudflats, into salt marsh and across fields if the field is um, soft enough or has been recently ploughed. So they've got to be able to get their bill in there, really. And these birds are feeding uh, on invertebrates which are living an awful long way uh, down in the mud. But the, the birds that we have wintering with us are coming from, uh, uh, from northern Scandinavia and Finland in particular. We know that through, through rigging recoveries. So it's an interesting story to tell. And a lot of the, um, the, the, uh, the breeding birds we have will leave and they'll head south. And the breeding birds are, are having a, a real big problem because they're, 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 they're not producing enough young uh, in the breeding quarters. So that's a real big problem we have. It's not such an issue in Scandinavia, um, but the, the, uh, the, there, is, there is investigations going on there and we haven't got all the answers to that one yet. But there's the longest build one. So running down to a smaller build one, we're, we're going to get into now two, two species of godwits which uh, frequent a bit of coastline. Godwits, on the face of it, can be quite tricky to separate. There's black-tailed godwits and this species, which is the bar-tailed godwit. And you look at them, and they look, they, you see them and you think, gosh, they look just the same. But actually there is, a, there is subtle differences with them. You see them in flight, you can see the, the, the detail of the tail here quite, quite easily. And it's very easy to identify that as a bar-tailed godwit because it's, it's got bar-tails on its tail, for goodness sake, so it's got to be a bar tail. But if you check the bill out on this one, you can see it's got a slightly upturned bill. You can just pick that out as it's uh, superficially like a curlew, you know, the, the back markings and the little bit of white going up the back and the barring on the tail, superficially like a curlew, but it's this, this um, straight-ish bill is a, is, a, is a giveaway. But again, separating from a black tail, Black tail's got a straight bill and the, the uh, bar tail has got a slight, I don't, hope you can see the slight upturn, just a slight upturn there. Um, but it's really quite noticeable on the ground as well. But yes, interesting, even on the ground, you can see, and as they're feeding, you can see these birds have got bar tails. We can see where the bar tails are coming from as well. And initially the, we thought there was just one big surge of, of bar tails coming through. And bar tails, like a lot of waders, we'll use the UK and Northumberland, the Northumberland shore, as a staging post, as a service station on, its, on their onward migration. So these birds are, are traveling and they're just picking up um, and, and they're kind of staying several weeks perhaps before they head on and heading down into, sometimes even into, into North Africa. But it's an interesting thing sort of not starting to appear now where we're, we, we have identified two distinct races of of bar-tailed godwits and I was just reading some stuff this morning and there's a third race of northern European bar-tailed godwit being identified. I haven't got enough of that in my head just yet but you can see where they're coming from. The Tamarensis is coming from a from further north, this one here um, from the Tamar as, as the name suggests and Laponica um, is coming from kind of northern Scandinavia which is the kind of the Finnish birds that we were referring to. That's the ones we expect to come in winter on our bit of the our bit of the coastline, and the Tamarensis may well use um, part of southern UK as a staging post before it heads down into Africa for uh, for for the winter. Fascinating story, and it's quite interesting to tease out um, as we did with the uh, with some of the geese species. Tease out some of the the races of this, not quite subspecies, but races uh, as well to pick out their population and trying to identify where these birds are coming from, which helps in the conservation, well, or can help in the conservation of these species. Now, the quite closely related cousin of the, uh, of the bar tail is the, is the black tail. And the black tail, as I mentioned, has a slightly tra a straighter bill than the, uh, than the bar tails. They feed in a very similar way, although you do tend to find bar tails uh, on the shore, uh, whereas the bar tails, sorry, the black tails tend to be on more fresh. 
it's not exclusive, but that's kind of uh, how they how they the split works. But we do find black-tailed goblets on estuaries, where bar tails tend to be more on the uh, on the open coast. But uh, let, let put it in, into some sort of perspective. Bar-tailed godwits are numbering something like um, uh, several thousand, whereas black tails will be, if they're lucky, measuring into several hundred uh, of them wintering in this part of the world. They tend to winter a little bit further south. Um, and you see them when they first return, both black tails and bar tails, when they first return, they're brick red uh, and they're, 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 they're tremendous. And you, you would hardly think they're the same species when it comes to um, their, their, uh, their breeding plumage, but when it comes to, sorry, when you, you compare their, their winter plumage to their breeding plumage, quite incredible. But we're looking at the at black tails in flight. You can see they've got a strong black band at the end of their tail and uh, with a, a, a terrific sort of white uh, stripe in their wings. It's quite, they're quite different to the, to the, the, the bar tails, whereas the bar tails didn't have any white in the wing and they have the little bars on their tails as well. So it's, uh, it's quite an interesting one. But the bar tails um, suggest the ones that we have are coming down from Iceland, uh, whereas there's another population of uh, uh, bar tails which is breeding in, in Scandinavia, which are wintering uh, in Southern Europe, whereas the ones that we get are coming from Iceland. And that will be a recurring theme when it comes to a, lot, a number of our waders. But moving on to the kind of the open shore, the sandy shore, there is a species which is particularly almost uniquely associated with that shore, exclusively associated with the, with the sandy shore, and that's the sandaling. And it's, it's a bird you will be familiar with, and it's the one that, that chases the tide. And these birds are feeding on the microscopic invertebrates, which are turned in the, uh, by, this, by this, the sea as it sort of breaks on the shore. The sand is turned, exposing microscopic uh, invertebrates. These birds are feeding quite voraciously, but they're chased in and out of the tide. Um, in winter plumage, they're very, very white, black bills, black legs, very white and silvery, quite distinct. But when you see them in their summer plumage, they're, they're very gingery. They look almost a different species. But look at the, the body shape, the black bill and the black legs. And these birds are coming from, from two different directions into, into the UK. And again, these birds, a lot of them are using uh, us as a staging post to, um, uh, to, to their winter quarters. Probably one of the, the most unique, sorry, the ubiquitous of all of the, um, uh, the, the wading birds that we have is the, the, the Dunlin. Um, the, new, the most numerous by, by a long way, I suspect. Uh, and some, to some extent, they're kind of uh, almost nondescript, but it can be said about a lot of waders. But if you look more closely, you can identify them. The bill length against the bill head, the, against the, the, the head, you work out that relationship, that ratio, that helps you identify waders. How long is the bill? Um, but looking at this bird here, it's got little, little dark marks on the side of its breast. And that tells me that it's, um, it's a bird of the, uh, it's a bird of the year, which is early autumn. And it's coming down to spend some time on the, in, in the, on the Northumberland coast or the Northeast coast for the winter. It's a bird of the year. Whereas in the breeding plumage, they're very easily identified by the black bellies. But again, look at the, uh, the bill and head and how they, the relationship of those two things and the size of them in that ratio, that helps you sort out. Is it a long bill? Is it a short bill? Looking at the sandaling, the sandaling have a, 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 a smaller bill compared to the size, whereas the Dunham will have a, perhaps a one and a half length uh, of its head to the to the bill, you know, so it's, it kind of works that way. Helps you sort of sort them out in due course. But we're seeing several races of, of Dunland moving through the UK and uh, both ways on the return migration and the northerly right migration. Don't get ourselves bogged down too much. What I want to do is to show really the journey some of these birds have. Uh, birds which are coming through us and there's, we see these birds uh, and they're making their migration. They're using us as a staging post, and some of, those, some of them are using us as a, as a kind of a, a winter quarters. Quite amazing. Uh, red knot is another species. We see them like this in, in early in the autumn when they're returning and when they're heading south, but we see them more, more likely like this. Red knot, you think, this is what a, what a misnomer this bird is. It's a grey knot, but obviously there's, there isn't such a thing as a grey knot. It's described after it's summer, summer plumage. But they will feed in tight packs. And they're another nondescript looking bird, but they've got green legs. That's helpful. Look at the bill length. Look at the bill length compared to the head. Look at the gray, color of the legs, green legs. Think about that, gray body. That's, that's kind of a really useful tip to identifying uh, red knot or knot as we just 
call them. Um, this is quite unusual to see them feeding as individuals. But not red knot have this fantastic migration. They'll come down from Arctic Canada, northern, northern Greenland. Some of them will travel through northern Greenland, down into the tip of, uh, of, of South Africa. Absolutely incredible. There are several races around the, uh, around the northern hemisphere, and the, the, all of them are taking on the same migration south into South America and into Australasia. F fabulous sort of um, journeys these birds are undertaking. Golden plover, another species which is kind of, which was packed, like the knot, you see quite big numbers and they'll be quite tight, tightly grouped. Golden plover are exactly the same. And, um, but we're moving into a, a slightly different group of, of wading birds, the plovers. And uh, look more closely at them, more rounded heads, shorter bills than the others. And look at the kind of the bill to the size of the head, to quarters of the size of the head, the bill length. Um, kind of get in the round head pointing in the direction of plover. But look at the back of this bird. This is a, um, a golden plover because of the colour of the back. But it's in the breeding plumage, it would have a, a black belly. Uh, and uh, a lot of the birds from the far north will have a black face as well. But we can see where the birds are coming from. They're coming from, from Iceland that winter here. These birds will come spend time right down through here. Um, so the majority of them are coming, we get, we get birds which are moving through here, but the majority of them are coming from Iceland. If close relative is the grey plover. You, you remember the picture of the, of the golden plover, the golden back, well this has got a grey back to it. Um, but notice the head shape and the bill, but look at the big eye, that's another, another feature of this, of this group. Um, quite sort of, uh, quite, quite sort of uh, identifiable because that sort of, that combination. But these birds like the sandy shore as well. When we see them in their coming out of their, their breeding plumage, um, this is a, a probably in the uh, mid-autumn where it's molting through on the shore. Black faces right through them to the inner part. And look at the back, you can see where the kind of the grey uh, plover comes from. But the, the but the Americans call this species black-bellied plover, which you can imagine why they would get how they got that name. But a, a good way of identifying um, Grey plover is by the underwing. It's the only wader that we have which has black oxters, black underwing, black underwing coverts. So if you see this flying away from you, you know you've got um, you've got grey plover. And we see them in much smaller numbers. We'll see several thousands of um, of golden plovers. There, there are an awful lot. There's there's a, perhaps a thousand now currently on Lindisfarne. There's about sort of um, eighteen hundred at Boomer. Uh, and uh, similarly further down the coast, so they're, they're in tight groups, whereas grey plover, we see quite a lot at Lindisfarne, but we'll only see tens and twenties further uh, away from Lindisfarne in, in small groups. But we see them gathering on the shore like this, uh, and uh, they will try to find high tide roosts, and it's quite important that we know these high tide roosts because the birds are at their most vulnerable here. Uh, because they're conserving their energy, they can't feed and they'll have to conserve their energy. They can't feed because the tide's covering their feeding ground. But the birds, the, 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 gold, the grey plover are coming from an awful long way north, further north than, 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 than golden plover. They're coming from northern Siberia. So to make, they're making a big, big, big journey. And the third member of this trio of plovers is the lapwing. Um, we're quite familiar with lapwing in, our, in, our, in the, the farmland fields around us. And um, we think of them being uh, under pressure, which they are, because the habitat is their breeding habitat is under uh, is under pressure. But these breeding birds will leave, similar to the curlews. These breeding birds will leave to be backfilled by by Scandinavian birds. The back of even the back of July, we're seeing big numbers of curlew coming from Scandinavia to spend. It's the winter, as far as they're concerned, and you kind of. You say to folks, well, the winter starts in July for, for ornithologically speaking. They look, oh, they doesn't believe you. It's amazing. But we see where the, the lapwings are, are, are heading to. You can see these purple dots. These are UK ringed lapwings. They're heading south for, for winter. And the yellow ones are the birds which are going to come to us uh, for, for the winter. Quite, quite an interesting tale, that one. But we look at ringed plover, uh, another uh, similar species to the other plovers, but it's a much smaller one. So it's not really a plover like the others. Um, short bill, and we tell it from the little ring plover by um, the little ring plover would have a, an old dark bill and a yellow eye ring. Um, but when you see it fly, the, um, 
the ring plover's got a white flash in it in the wing, whereas the ring plover hasn't got a white flash. And again, the ring plover are coming from a long way north to stage with us on the uh, on the, the North Sea coast, the Northumberland coast, uh, before they make their own mud migration. And interestingly, they'll get into um, uh, into West Africa uh, for, for, for winter. Oyster catcher, probably a ubiquitous species, one of the noisy species that we see. And we tend to think, oh, they're kind of they're here all year and all year round. But they are. But they, they do breed in the area, but actually they leave. They, the breeding birds that we have, the similar tail to the others, to the curlew and the, the lapwing, and we're getting birds coming down from Iceland. And believe it or not, bird coming down from Greenland has been recorded down through into the UK. Quite amazing. Or a uh, bird from the UK has been found in Greenland, shall we say. And Redshank, the keeper of the marsh, the noisy bird of the, um, of the marsh, easily identified because of their, uh, their, their red legs uh, and uh, big white flashes in their wings. But it's, it's one of the most um, obvious waders of the, of the shore. And these birds that we're having for the winter, these birds are coming from Iceland as well. So you can see there's a pattern. There is a pattern with all of this. Birds moving from the north to the south for, for the winter time. Moving from the soft shore-ish onto the, the rocky shore, um, we, we hit upon the, um, the turnstone. Uh, and, and amongst this group of turnstones, there's one or two ring plovers, one or two purple sandpipers, but we'll, we'll talk about sandaling. We'll talk about them in a, in a bit. Uh, but turnstones are a bird of the, uh, of the rocky shore primarily, but we'll find them on the soft shore as well. Quite pretty when they come through. Uh, and this is one's, this one is in breeding plumage uh, at the back of the summer when they're coming in. But we see their migration. Their migration is vast. And they're coming down from, from Arctic Canada through Greenland, through into, um, uh, into, into Britain. And this is the sort of journey that they will take. Quite a phenomenal journey, really. And I was involved in a study uh, several years ago uh, where we captured a, a number of turnstones, ring, uh, colour ring them, and put radio tracker on their, on their backs. And we caught about a dozen. And we put radio transmitters on, and these these were, had a a life of about twelve days. These transmitters, and then they fell off. Uh, and my, my job was I went out and uh, every other day and tracked where these birds had gone to. And what we were interested in was actually trying to find out what their home range is in their winter quarters, whether the birds were uh, heading on migration or just using a staging post. They come from an awful long way, and we're trying to figure out what was what was going on with them. So these birds. Uh, actually we discovered offshore islands was quite important for them, uh, particularly at high tide as the high tide roost as protection uh, and they went off the Coquit and the Farn Islands, a good chance to go across there tracking these birds during the winter time. But what we found is that majority of these birds, uh, or the, 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 kind of the, the evidence was suggesting that they travelled no more than five kilometres in their home range in their winter quarters. Once they got here, that's where they'll stay. Quite, quite incredible when you think about it. A lovely bit of work that really was. Uh, Good, good work. But yes, for the purple sandpipers, we need to go offshore. We see them, um, uh, they, they, they really are attached to, to the rocky shore uh, and they, they occur in quite big numbers, although you wouldn't think so. They're hard to see because they, they can be hidden in the, on the rocky shore. And you think, well, they're not very purple to me. I actually see them in breeding plumage there. They are very purple. This is a bird I, I photographed by accident on Cogut Island and got the ring, um, the colour ring on it. Uh, and I didn't realize this until I got home and, and got the picture on the on the on the, the, the computer. And then a, it's obviously an enlargement. Got in touch with the people and discovered that this bird had been ringed in Svalbard, right up here. Uh, and it was found down here uh, on Cockett Island. But this was a, a great example. This is a species, a great example of short stopping. So birds are heading south onto the Norwegian coast after breeding season, and they're spending time here. And they'll only be pushed off by, by bad weather before they get before they set off to, to the UK to, to winter. And we discovered this uh, in a local sense by some of the work I was doing on um, looking at uh, uh, bird numbers, bird timings to help with, uh, uh, with harbour refurbishment. And we're looking at timings of birds. And we noticed over the last 30 years that the arrival dates for purple sandpipers was actually getting later, later each year. And uh, the majority of purple sandpipers wasn't weren't arriving back until kind of into November time, uh, whereas say 30 years ago it was actually in September. So we're seeing a change there, and this is driven, we think, 
by, via climate change. The weather is much more benign a little bit further, further north, so the winter hasn't got there yet. So they stay there as long as the winter's away. As soon as the winter hits, they'll clear out. And that phenomenon is known as short stopping. And that is a really new bit, bit of behavior that's been going on there. It's, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. And we're, we're watching the evolution of bird migration. It's, in a, it's, 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 it's before your eyes, and it's fascinating to, to, um, to, to watch that. And this is a bird in almost in breeding plumage. You can see it, oh, it's almost purple, almost purple. But the, the, the yellowish bill and the yellow orange legs kind of uh, tell you it's purple side pipe as well. One of the big issues that we have at the moment is the increase in numbers of people, with their dogs using the shore. Um, we, we're engaging a range of bits of work trying to understand this. And it's become quite a uh, quite sharp focus because of kind of the COVID situation, more dogs have, and more people walking dogs. And as I mentioned earlier, high tide roosts are so vitally important to these birds because it's the only time they have a chance to get rest. And when they're feeding, particularly when the weather's bad, they've got to feed to keep their energy up to, to survive. And when you see numbers of people on shore like this, you think, ah, oh, goodness, what chance have they got? And this is a common sight now across a lot of our, a lot of our shore. And it's a real worry. We're trying to understand what it's about. And there's one or two little uh, ideas now for mitigation and, and so forth. But the sea is, is, uh, is, is, out, is always there and it's always kind of uh, capturing sort of imagination. People will go and watch offshore uh, because when the north wind blows, birds get blown from the, from the north, uh, from the Arctic Ocean to the south. And this is a little oak. I've been blown south into the North Sea and it was re redistributing itself. And they're heading back north again. So we pick them up as they head north. And this happens uh, regularly during the course of the winter when the, the north wind blows. And we've got a, a bit of northerly coming in the next few days. So we may well see this happen uh, quite soon uh, where we'll, we'll see little oaks. And these guys are really quite small. Uh, we had numbers of red throated diver during the winter time, not in the breeding plumage, of course, and they're feeding in the uh, just offshore in amongst the rocky areas. Uh, black throated diver in, in fewer numbers and great northern di divers to it, to, again, to a lesser extent, but they are there. Also, on this really horrendous bit of coastline, you're seeing the you know, really fantastic sea ducks. These are our long tailed ducks, and these, are, these don't winter here, these don't breed here, rather, these are wintering here. You can see the, uh, the, the, the female or the immature male on the, on the left and the, kind of in the center, there's a male just coming in to its breeding plumage. And these are gonna be here through till kind of March time. And these birds actually can be storm driven into harbors. This, this photograph was taken in Sea Houses Harbor last winter. But we do see uh, greaves offshore, uh, black neck greaves and not so many numbers, but actually Slavonian greaves. And Slavonian greaves um, don't have this dark patch on the cheek. Their, their dark bit comes down to just point, just about here. So yes, so black neck greaves, uh, red neck greaves in quite good numbers, uh, although the numbers are, in, are, are diminishing. And great crested greaves, believe it or not, uh, spending time offshore on the Northumberland coast. And a classic of our bit of coastline, a bit of shore, is the common scoter. These are always almost just a bit too far away to, to see properly, but these are the dark ducks, the black ducks that we see on the sea. And the, but the bright orange bills of the males give it away. You can see the female on the left with the, the paler grey cheeks. Uh, and amongst these, these um, uh, scoters, you'll often see the grebes uh, feeding alongside them. Occasionally you'll see the velvet scoter. You'll see, the, the, look at the, the white in the wing here of the velvet scoter. And that is really quite obvious in, in flight. But again, mixed in amongst all of these, there's the common eider, uh, the eider duck, the, 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 the county bird of Northumberland in amongst that. But we do see um, when the sea kind of really gets its stander up, we can see sort of big seas and you think, goodness me, what's happening out there? So we see a lot of uh, birds which would want to spend time on the sea actually coming into the, the safe haven of harbours. We see a lot of those ducks coming in. We also see species like gusander in building numbers. This is a a uh, female gusander, easily told from a red breast of Naganza by this, this demarcation here. The, the um, uh, red breast of Naganza has this uh, darkness coming down a little bit further, it merges. So a red, red breast of Naganza, the front is merges, whereas a gusander is quite clear cut. This is a female type. And the male is quite obvious, of course, 
Um, but these birds are now coming into harvest. And, and you, you can see them sort of in, into numbers of sort of 50s, 60s or 70s. And this is quite a relatively recent phenomenon as well. Um, but golden eye, we see some golden eye numbers coming in for safe haven. And, um, and they're just coming in with some nice plumage now. They're coming through their eclipse plumage. But they're storm driven, they can be storm driven. But quite a, again, a change. I remember uh, 20 years ago, um, we year listers in Northumberland. We used to go to to um, Craster to see uh, the wintering Mediterranean gull. There used to be one wintering Mediterranean gull 20, 20 years ago in Northumberland. That was it. Now um, the uh, in New Biggin, where the, the kind of the focus has become, uh, there's something like um, oh 150 birds at New Biggin itself. Here on the Al Mystery, I've seen several at a time. But these birds, it's a real change of behaviour. We have them as a breeding species on Cogan Island, for example, you only a couple of pairs, but it's not those birds we see wintering. We're seeing birds from Central Europe because a lot of these birds are, are colouring and we're, we're tracking them back. So a lot of these birds are colouring and they're coming from Central Europe, which is fascinating. It's a real change in behaviour, this. And it's not just with Medi Mediterranean gulls, it's happened with greater blackback gulls and common gulls as well. Even the ubiquitous black headed gull is supplemented or replaced by continental birds. This bird was, uh, uh, was a regular attender at Bamborough. You can clearly re uh, pick out the, um, uh, the colouring number on this bird. And uh, it's, this bird was ringed in Poland and it's, it's been back to Bamborough several winters. And it's replaced, it's re the, these continental birds are replacing uh, the, um, uh, the, the British bread ones, if you like. They're, they're kind of moving south for the, um, uh, for the winter. But we do see some of the, uh, the, the <laughs> Real winter visitors from a long way north. The Glogus gull and its close allies, close pal, the Iceland gull. These are birds from the far north. And again, when the north wind blows, we'll spend time in our bit of the bit of the coast. Um, this is known locally as and, and um, in Iceland as the Burgomaster because it's a brute of a bird, not as big as a Greta Blank Bank gull, but it's equally as vicious. But this is an immature bird. Go to the uh, North Shields Fish Key, which is the best place in, in the area for we're seeing these white wingles, these white wingers. And that's how we tell they, they were from the other ones. You can, see, you can pick it out on this bird. There's absolutely no black in this wing at all. Whereas in all of the other gulls that we see, um, like the, um, you know, the blackbacks and so forth, they've all got black in the herring gulls, they've all got black in their wings. Glogus gull, ice and gull. And this ivory gull, the mythical ivory gull, I haven't got any black in their wings. Um, this is a bird from the high Arctic, which only occurs every 30 or 40 years in this part of the world. They, they feed on um, rotting uh, corpses of uh, giant sea mammals. And we've got it currently with this, um, there's a minke whale rotting on the shore at, at, um, at Booma. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing the ivory gulls feeding on that this winter. Fingers crossed, but I'm uh, not holding breath. But it's a rare species a very rare species from the far north. But yes, as the winter progresses through into kind of the false spring, you know, birds are sort of starting to become kind of accustomed, they're coming in short, particularly the orcs, the guillemots and the razor bills, as I mentioned earlier, the, the birds which, have, which breed with us, they've headed out into the kind of the North Sea for, their, for the winter, they're coming back in shore because they, they've got to get back in early on the breeding grounds, but they can be caught because of false springs. It can cut it really quite bad if they can't feed, they become really very emaciated. And we're seeing birds like this as a razor bill. Uh, and we've seen quite a lot of birds like this just recently, of course, but they're coming in shore to, to get it, to get this back on the sites as early as they can. But unfortunately they've caught in the, the turmoil of the, of, the, of the sea and they can't feed. And, you know, the sea is, is, is a hard task, taskmaster, very, very difficult to survive in that. And a lot of birds perish. And they perish at the bill of a of the greater black black gull. And this is this is nothing for a great black black gull to take a razor bill, take it quite easily. And it has this is the fate for birds which come back too early and get caught by bad weather. So it's a real issue for some species, but it's part of their strategy. There is this nat nat natural wastage going on there. However, as the kind of the winter eases, birds are coming back into breeding grounds. The fulmer, for example, the fulmer's got an incredibly long um, uh, breeding season, but they've got to be back by, they're coming investigating in, into sort of, into December, into January. 
middle of winter, the back end, sort of looking at, at nesting territories. This photograph was taken on December the 30th last year. So they're back in their, their breeding quarters. They're getting back in early. So there is the sign of the change is, is happening, sign of the changing of the season. Even cormorants, this is a, a February cormorant, still has its fabulous sort of its th white thigh patch and its, its kind of crazy, crazy head mane. Um, this is classic breeding plumage in February for all, the whole things. And of course, the Ida is in its bestest plumage. And you go to the harbours in February time and you'll hear the ubiquitous noise of, of Idas because they're casting around for the females because they need to get in early. So yes, get into the harbours, you'll hear the ooh, the ooh of the Ida displaying to their females. So that is a wonderful time of year. So winter is, a, is an incredible time of the year. All different facets, all different stories, but it's a wonderful time of year. Fantastic. Thank you. And thanks very much for listening. And uh, thanks a lot.